standing as I read the Word of God. Open your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians, chapter 2. I'll begin in verse 5 and just read down through verse 11. Philippians chapter 2, and beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And let us look to our Lord in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do come before Thee, Lord, once again, giving You thanks for all that You have done for us. We thank Thee, our Lord, for allowing us the privilege of coming to the house of the Lord to hear the word of the Lord. And I ask, Father, that You would be with me as Thy servant. And may you give me liberty and ability to present thy word in truth and in love. I ask, Father, that you would be with all of those that have been made known unto the church, the requests that I have made known, and those that I know not about that we know you know about. And I ask, Lord, that thy will would be done. As it's been prayed, may I echo, Lord, that we would pray <coughs> for our country. And we would pray, Father, for Mr. Trump. And we ask, Lord, that you would... Enable him to rule in a way that is in alignment with your word. And Father, that's not too big a thing to ask. We, we don't need to be afraid to ask that, Lord. We pray that he would rule in a way that is in alignment to the word of God. And Father, I ask that you would just give him good, godly counsel. And Father, I just again also want to pray for those of us that live in this country that we would go forward as lights in this dark world. Father, I ask that you would be with each and every one of us now, and if there be any among us that are lost and undone and know you not as Savior, Father, we pray that this would be the day of salvation. Forgive us of our sins. May thy will be done. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. <clears throat> Title of the message is Jesus Christ, the Incomparable Savior. Jesus Christ, the Incomparable Savior. Savior. Well, we're beginning a time of year that is set aside to honor and to give thanks to Almighty God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The time of year when many of us stop and count our blessings to give thanks and to celebrate the fact that Jesus came into the world and gave His life for sinners. But sadly, a lot of people in our world are ignorant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of us that do know Him in the full pardon and forgiveness of sin can testify and be able to say this morning with all assurity that there is no one like Jesus Christ. In the history of the world, many billions of people have lived and died. Countless Billions of people have lived and died. Many have left their mark on the tapestry of time. But no one in all history has made as permanent an impression as a humble Jewish man named Christ Jesus. No one in all of history has left the impression that Jesus Christ our Lord did. No one compares to Christ. Had he just been an ordinary man, the world would have forgotten him as they have done billions of countless others. 
But he was no ordinary man. He is the sinless Savior, and no one compares to our precious Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to take a few minutes this morning, okay, when I say a few, like 40, I want to take about 30 or 40 minutes and go over these precious truths that show us that there's never been anyone like Jesus Christ. That He is truly incomparable in every aspect of His life. He is the one and the only Savior for mankind. These few precious verses tell us why He is and was so different. These great lessons from His life that set him apart from everyone else who had ever lived or who will ever live on this planet. So this morning, I want us to look at, first of all, <coughs> that he was incomparable in his coming. Secondly, that his death is incomparable. And thirdly, that he is incomparable in his acclamation. So, again, first of all, Christ Jesus our Lord was incomparable in His coming. What do I mean? Well, look at again Philippians 2, and let me just read again verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which, also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Beloved, I need you to know, and I hope that you know before I am finished today, that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is incomparable to the coming of anyone else that has ever come to be. Now as we get started here in verse 5, notice the attention that the Apostle Paul is drawing to us in verse 5. Let this mind be in you. So as we continue now to talk about the humility of Christ, as we continue to talk about the servanthood of Jesus Christ, Paul says to us under the inspiration of God, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And so then we see verses 6 through 8 that tell us the kind of mind that should be in us. Now I know and you know that none of us can live the perfect sinless life of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. But let these thoughts, let this mind be in you. And if you do that, you will find that these verses, not only as they teach us about the incomparable coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, humble us as we learn that He was humble. And this will make sense in a few moments. We know, as we're thinking about the, these verses, and we've been taught from the Word of God that we must walk in the same Spirit and walk after the steps of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who, beloved, humbled Himself to the suffering and death for us not only to satisfy God's justice, but to pay the price for our redemption and to set as an example, to set himself as an example for those that follow him. The coming of the Lord was very humble, and the language that God has Paul to use is very expressive. We are told in no uncertain terms, leaving no doubt that Jesus Christ was a real man. Fully God, fully man. So I'm not preaching to erase the deity of Christ, 
But I want you to understand the humanity of Christ. And I want you to understand that there is none that compare to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, verse 6 now. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Listen again. While Christ was here as a man, now again, the Lord Jesus Christ was always and still fully God, but as a man, the Lord Jesus Christ humbled Himself so that again, He as a man was not equal with God. And that when, and I'm getting ahead of myself, when we get to the, the, the second part of the message about His death being incomparable, when He was nailed to the cross, so much so that the Father turned His back. Jesus Christ was incomparable in His coming. The Lord Jesus Christ did not see being of the same essence as God something to be grasped and held onto. He turned it loose for a season for us. Beloved, this is true humbling of spirit. The Prince of Glory, the one and only begotten Son of God, the King of the world, came down and humbled Himself as a man and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. His coming is incomparable. This is what it truly means to humble ourselves. To not seek anything from anyone. Christ did not come and say, I am owed this. Don't you know who my father is? Now he could have. And of course he was fully God. And he even had the power to do all those things. But who being in the form of God thought it not robbery while as a man to be equal with God. But still could have pulled, don't you know who my father is? But Christ our Lord, even at times, what? Had no place to lie His head. The very one who could have easily and surely said, My Father is the God of heaven, and you're going to treat me like this. Under no such words. Truly humbled Himself from the glories of heaven. Did not come and say, I am owed this, I am owed that. I'm entitled to this, I'm entitled to that because of my lineage, because of who my Father is. My Heavenly Father is. What an example for us. The Bible says, but made himself of no reputation. No reputation means... To empty, the Lord Jesus did not seek fame. Though for a while he had some, didn't he? <laughs> right? Though for a while the multitudes followed him and said, Oh, this man is so great. He has healed the blind. He has raised the dead. Oh, we love the Lord Jesus. The very same crowd that turned their back on him. But the Lord Jesus did not come to seek reputation for himself. We're going to see in a few seconds. He made no reputation. He came in the form of a servant. I don't want to get ahead of that. He emptied Himself. Beloved, His coming is incomparable. He didn't seek fame. He didn't seek honor. He didn't seek reputation. The Lord Jesus Christ was humble from His beginnings on earth. He left His glory in heaven for a humble beginning on earth. Born in a stable, no less. Right? Right? The King of glory humbled Himself and made of Himself no reputation. Emptied Himself. Didn't seek to be honored by man. He emptied Himself of His deity and endured the scorn of men for you 
and for me that know him as Lord and Savior. That verse says that he took upon him the form of a servant. For all appearances, the Lord Jesus would have passed as a lowly slave or a servant. Now we know that he is the exalted king of glory. And we know that right now he sits on the right hand of the Father. But just imagine if you would for a moment, uh, just say an earthly prince who had been raised in a palace. An earthly prince who had all riches untold of him. His father was king, king of the land. And that prince was to be sent out into what we'll call the common people. That prince would have a life-altering shock, having come from the glories of the palace to being a servant, to being a poor boy out on the streets. A prince in a king's house would undoubtedly want to say, my father is king. And you treat me like this. It would be a natural human desire. Christ Jesus our Lord in his coming is incomparable and he did no such thing. And all this, all the while, being fully God. It's truly remarkable, beloved, if we allow these verses to just speak to us. Don't, don't allow all of my words around these verses to ruin the beautiful context that they are here in Philippians chapter 2. He took upon him the form of a servant. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 53. We'll, we'll be in Isaiah a little bit later as well, but I, I just want to read one verse quickly to you. And as I said, we'll turn back to Isaiah later in the message. <coughs> in Isaiah... Chapter 53, in verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Despised and rejected of men. Who in here likes to be despised and rejected? I don't think any of us within our own human flesh say, and I often say these type of things, wake up in the morning and say, man, I hope everybody despises me today. That'll be great. We don't wake up just thinking that. I hope everybody rejects everything I have to say today. We don't just wake up saying that. But the king of glory, who made himself of no reputation, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, says in Isaiah 53 that he was despised and rejected. Despised and rejected. Ultimately, God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus, was rejected by the very people who claimed to worship, serve, and love Him. As I said earlier in the message, yeah, for a while, the masses, the multitudes, oh, hell, King Jesus! Later on, second part of the message, crucify. Crucify Him was their cry. In John chapter 1 and verse 11. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that... Oh, I'm sorry, verse 11. He, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The very one who, as I mentioned who could have come and lived like a king that he was, lived as a servant, even at times having no place to lay his head. This is truly humbling. His earthly parents didn't have a great home, didn't have a great lifestyle, didn't have a great amount of money. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Verse 7 also says, and was made in the likeness 
of men. In the very image of God. God says, and you know, I'll turn there to Genesis 1.26, right? That God let us make man in our own image. And Christ Jesus was made in the likeness of men. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, God made himself in man's image. So the Lord Jesus was born as a man. He lived as a man. He suffered and died as a man. He was, in every sense of the word, a real, genuine human man. Jesus Christ knew pain. He knew poverty. He knew sorrow. He knew loneliness and rejection. He knew laughter hope, and friendship. He knew every aspect of human experience or human existence, yet he knew no sin. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> he was, you know, tempted as we were in all parts, and he lived, you know, as James says, live life as a human, as we read here in Philippians chapter 2, yet as I said, His coming is incomparable because Christ Jesus the Lord did all of that yet without sin, becoming the full payment for our sin. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Praise be to God for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who understands us, and I would say inside and out. <laughs> he came. When he became a man, that's why his coming is incomparable to any other, and or ever would be, when he came as a man, he never stopped being God. While Jesus Christ was 100% man, he was also 100% God. He concealed his heavenly fame, frame with an earthly frame. And I could say fame as well. Quite remarkable, the coming of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ literally came into this world and walked among men <clears throat> as a perfect sinless human being, but made himself of no reputation. I've got three more verses that I, I want to show you here. I have a lot of verses today as God was just speaking to me so much as we went through this, but John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Aren't you grateful this morning for the grace and truth of the Savior, the Lord Jesus? Full of grace and truth was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word from the beginning, God Almighty, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Then we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is perfected before me. And He was before, uh, I'm sorry, before me, for He was before me. I said I have a few more verses for you. First Peter Chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I can't leave these out. 
They're so precious. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. For even here too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And I could get ahead, right? I could read verse 24. It's the second part of the message. Who, his own self, bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. You see... The Lord Jesus Christ is incomparable in His coming. There's no one else in the world like Him. The rest of humanity was born bearing the sin stain of Adam. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Lord Jesus Christ entered this world free from Adam's sin because He had no earthly father. He alone was holy in His birth and in His coming. And that's really important as we continue to go through these verses here. And hopefully this is beginning to make sense. Because secondly, Christ's death is incomparable. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, which we have read, which is our text. I read it to you one more time at least. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. One of the most humiliating forms of death was that of the cross. We read in our Sunday school class that you were a curse of God when you hung upon the cross in your death. His death is incomparable. We are told that Jesus Christ, the God-man, willingly, understand willingly, now still fully God and still fully man, allowed himself to be overtaken for, a, 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 for, for a, a while, for just a moment, by death. The one who is called in Acts 3, the Prince of Life, died for you and for me that are saved by his grace. The one who is the resurrection and the life, as John 11 describes to us, <laughs> humbled himself and allowed the cruel fingers of death to wrap themselves around him so that we may experience life everlasting. His death is incomparable because Christ Jesus the Lord is the only one that by the power that is in Him was able to escape death for all eternity, having risen from the grave three days later. Amen. Christ Jesus our Lord, His death is incomparable. As I pointed out in the past, the death that Christ died was no ordinary death. The Bible says it that it was even the death of the cross. As I said, no more, there hasn't been a more humiliating form or no more brutal form of execution that has ever existed in the history of the world. It's a humiliating death. The humbling of the Lord. Let this mind be in you. Hmm. Striking words from the Apostle Paul. The death of the Lord went into his entire nervous system when the spikes were driven into his hands and into his feet. Make no mistake that it was a painful and humiliating death. Back to Isaiah 53, if you would. Back in Isaiah chapter 53. His death is incomparable. Isaiah 53, and I'll just read a few more verses from this beautiful, beautiful uh, chapter in the Word of God. And I'll read to you verses 3 through 7 now. He was despised and rejected of men, 
a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. The King of glory, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, suffered death on the cross, bruised for our iniquities. Think about your iniquities if you are here today having been saved by the grace of Almighty God. The death of Jesus Christ is incomparable to any other death in all the world. We have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us. My entire sin debt has been paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. All my guilt, all my shame. <coughs> Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The Lord Jesus died in horrible agony that you and I might live in boundless glory that trust in him. By the death of the Lord Jesus, it provided a redemption that is sufficient for all that have sinned, and the Father chose. The power and the sacrifice of the Lord is sufficient to save. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I get excited now when I start talking about how incomparable his death is because Christ lives, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let me read to you these verses in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He lives. You see, the death fingers that I told you that wrapped themselves around the Lord Jesus Christ could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. Christ Jesus lives. He lives today. He is alive. He rose from the grave. He is the risen Lord. Up from the grave He arose with a mighty triumph o'er His foes. I am here today because God is alive. That Jesus Christ our Lord is alive. Death could not hold Him. The grave could not keep Him. Yes, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is incomparable. Incomparable. By his death, we have life. Who else could we ever say that about? But the Lord Jesus Christ. No other in all of history's death has brought life. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, like I said, this is no ordinary person. It, he's incomparable. Incomparable. <clears throat> he rose from the grave. Beloved, my Redeemer lives. He's alive. He's alive. And because He lives, we can know that He's not dead. Seems pretty logical, right? Because He lives, Christ Jesus is not dead. And since God is not dead, we can tell others that He lives and testify of Jesus Christ and tell them of His Son, the Lord Jesus, who is the Savior of men because He lives. 
We serve the risen Lord. We serve the alive Lord, who now is back at the right hand of the throne of God. Who is the King of glory. I can't hardly preach about the resurrection and the life of the Lord without turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Many of you that have heard me preach before were thinking, is the pastor going to go over to 1 Corinthians 15? Got it. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you also have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. It's glorious that we serve the risen Lord. Verse 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Verse 26 says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. His death is incomparable. So beloved, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is incomparable. He came as a servant. He came in the form of a servant in the likeness of men, made no reputation, humbled himself to death, even the humiliating death of the cross. His death is incomparable in that the grave, again, I'm sorry, death could not keep him and the grave could not hold him. He lives. It's an incomparable death. And you know what else is incomparable about the Lord? Is the acclamation of the Lord. Look at the rest of this in, in Philippians chapter 2. I'm moving along just, just right here. Philippians chapter 2, again. <clears throat> now let me, with all this context, with all this stuff that's now flowing through your brains, <clears throat> Let's read verses 9 through 11 once again. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in the earth, or things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is incomparable in the Father's acclamation. By the love that Christ displayed, by the price that he paid, he is highly exalted. Wherefore God hath also, or wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The phrase means to raise to the utmost of majesty. Beloved, if you're here and you've been saved by the grace of Almighty God, aren't you thankful that we can, at least as much as we can, behold the majesty of our great King, of our Savior? And one day, one day, those that are His will be in heaven worshiping our Savior for all eternity. Praise His holy name. He is highly exalted. He is praised and honored in His name. We have been told here in the text that He has been given a name that is above every name. His name is Jesus. No name in the entire world is more special than the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh yeah, as I mentioned, people abuse the name of Jesus. People blaspheme the name of Jesus. But God has highly exalted His name. Amen? God has highly exalted the name of Jesus. And we need to get out and tell the world about the Lord Jesus. At the name of Jesus, lives have been changed. Blind eyes have been opened. Deaf ears unstopped. Sins, shackles have fallen away. Night has turned to day. To speak, death has been swallowed up in victory of Jesus. Hope has replaced hopelessness. Dead men have come to life. Lost men have been found. Devils have trembled. Sinners have been broken. And sin stains have been erased. At the name of Jesus. 
God has highly exalted His name. The world wants nothing to do with Him. The world wants to cast Him out. But God has highly exalted His name, which is above every name. And I stand before you, a sinner saved by grace, confessing to you that I believe that the name of Jesus is the sweetest name ever to fall upon these ears. When I heard the message of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus in my life is cause for celebration. It's cause for celebration. The salvation that Jesus gives is what changed my life. <clears throat> we are told here that also in verse 10, there is coming a day when every person will bow and confess Him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Of God the Father. May we that know him bow now in the humble adoration. Throughout history men have ridiculed the Lord Jesus. They have mocked him. They have ignored him. His name has been blasphemed. He is ridiculed by the lost world. But the day is coming when his name will receive the glory and honor that he is worthy of. And I say, hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. God declares Jesus to be Lord. If he is Lord, then he is worthy to be loved and served, worshipped and obeyed. If he is Lord, then he is worthy of all our time, our talents, and our treasure. If he is Lord, he should be exalted, praised, and loved. If he is Lord, then he is to be Lord of all. And I read this as I got ready for this. For if he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord of all, or Lord at all. Now, understand that he is God and he is over all his creation. I'm talking about in our lives. He is to be Lord of our life. Well, beloved, these verses have reminded me that the Lord Jesus is an incomparable Savior. I praise His name that He came into this world, was born without sin, lived without sin, and yet He died for sin. I thank God that He rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven for our redemption. I praise God today for the unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise His holy name. You know, God saves sinners. <laughs> he saves sinners. And I'm thankful for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. If you want to know more about Him, we'd love to tell you more about Him. Jesus saved. May God use His Word and add the blessing to it. As we dismiss in prayer, if we can be a help to you in any way, we certainly offer ourselves to you. And let us also remember to ask a blessing upon the food. Shall we stand together? We dismiss in a word of prayer.